Every cheater should know that all the evil that he has caused can come back to him. Greetings, my dear viewer. The hero of this story notices red flags in his wife's behavior and hires a private investigator. And then, events develop rapidly like a hurricane. Let's listen to this story and find out how the main character copes with this storm of events. And while you're listening, according to tradition, put your royal like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Let's go. I have been trying for a long time to understand why it is so difficult for people to admit that they want to get divorced. Why do they resort to lies and hide their extramarital affairs? These questions have been on my mind for quite some time, especially when I'm trying to figure out my wife's actions. If she decided to play this insidious game, then she will have to face the consequences of her decisions. On Friday evening, a lively crowd gathered at the Elham Bra Lounge, who were having a great time. There was energy in the air, making the place seem alive and bright. I was sitting at the bar with a tonic in my hands, but I wasn't just singing and dancing like everyone else. I had a specific goal, which I knew was risky and could get me into serious trouble. While I was slowly sipping my drink, my gaze fell on a couple sitting at the other end of the room. I watched them closely for almost an hour, especially him. He was the main target of my assignment, a familiar face who appeared here every Friday night, probably to cheer for his wife's brother, a member of the band that performed in Elam Bra every week. After waiting patiently, my perseverance was rewarded when a great opportunity presented itself. When the music slowed down, the couple elegantly stood up and headed to the dance floor, giving them the opportunity to briefly connect and move in harmony. I got up from my seat and went to the parquet floor to join them. Creeping up behind him, I patted him on the shoulder and boldly asked, Do you mind if I join you? Startled, he turned to look at the uninvited guest who had interrupted his dance with his wife. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I quickly began to act. Filled with anger and frustration, I used my 200 pounds of strength to quickly knock him down with an unexpected blow. He collapsed to the ground, left defenseless and defeated. I took advantage of the moment to encroach on his pride. His wife, who was standing next to him, was stunned and shocked by what was happening. But her instant reaction did not allow her to accept what I took out of my pocket and handed to her. When she looked at the incriminating photo of her husband with my wife, her initial shock turned into rage. With the sharp tip of a hairpin, she inflicted many blows on her husband. I was waiting for the arrival of law enforcement officers for a possible conversation, but it turned out that no one had contacted them. After a while, several people came up to me to chat. The first person was the brother of a woman who danced with her husband to a song performed by the band. Right after that song, the band took a break and he came up to me. I realized that he wasn't going to fight, so I stayed where I was and continued to sip my drink. I stood and waited for him to come up to me. When he finally came up to me, he asked, Why did you hit Jim? In response, I took a photo out of my pocket and handed it to him. The woman in the picture is my wife, I explained. He took a quick look at the photo and handed it back to me. I always warned Norma that he was a jerk. Maybe now she'll finally believe me, he mused. It looks like I wasn't wrong. Confused, I asked, what was wrong? He shrugged and remarked, I figured he came here every Friday to support our band. It seems that your relationship with him is not what it seems, I said. You're right, I can't be around him and he knows it perfectly well. He only comes on Fridays because, according to my agreement with the management, all members of my family are entitled to free drinks. So why are you hanging around here? I thought you'd want to leave after you run into him, he asked. I had a feeling that the police might show up, and I would rather deal with them here than at home, I replied. It's doubtful that someone called them, he suggested. He is not popular, and most likely many of those present today enjoyed his disgrace. I should join the crowd, he said, walking away to join his bandmates. A few guys helped the jerk off the floor and escorted him back to the table, and his wife came over to me. Do you have any more of these? She asked, showing me the photo I had given her. 
I have dozens of them and several hours of video recording, I replied. Can I get copies? She asked. Of course, I replied. You created a problem for me tonight, do you understand that? Norma asked. I thought that by telling you I could solve the problem for you, I replied. But it's not like that. He can't take me home, and even if he could, I wouldn't let him in the house, Norma said. Don't worry, I'll take you home, I said. Then I'm ready to go, she replied. As we were driving in my car, I said, By the way, your brother mentioned that your name is Norma, so now that I know yours, it's only fair that you recognize mine. I'm Bob Lloyd. Under the circumstances, I can't say I'm glad to see you, but in a strange way, I'm probably glad, I said. It may seem strange, but I am grateful to you for giving me a valuable gift today, Norma said. A gift? I don't understand, I asked. You have given me freedom. I had long suspected that Jim was cheating on me, but I couldn't afford a private investigator to gather evidence. What you gave me today is the evidence I need to finally break off my relationship with him, she replied. I've had a nagging feeling for a long time that Vicky might be cheating on me. But it wasn't until my grandfather passed away and left me the money that I finally had the means to investigate. I kept the amount of the inheritance a secret from Vicky and used some of that money to get to the truth, I said. When we arrived at her house, she hesitated before inviting me in. I'd like to invite you inside, but I'm afraid you'll take it the wrong way, Norma said. Why? I asked. You might think that I invited you to get back at Jim for being with someone else, but that's not my intention. I want to invite you to get any information from you about Jim and his actions, Norma said. You can trust me, I assured her. I don't want to be like Vicky and stoop to that level, Norma said. When we entered her house and went into the living room, she pointed to the sofa and asked if I wanted a drink or if she should make coffee. I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee. I'm not going to stay here for long. If your husband comes back, I might consider leaving before things get out of hand, I said. He's not coming back. Before I left, I made it clear to him that he shouldn't come back. I warned him that if he returned, I would not hesitate to use a weapon, Norma said threateningly. Would you go that far? I asked. Probably not, but he knows I'm upset. He knows how I usually react when I'm angry and he knows I have a gun. Do you have a gun? asked Norma. You look stunned. I know a lot of women working in law enforcement who own firearms. I bought mine for protection when I put money in the bank at night. It's a 3 8 caliber llama, similar to a compact 45, and Jim knows I can handle it, Norma said with a grin. When she went into the kitchen to make coffee, I couldn't help but wonder why her husband contacted my wife especially if someone like Norma was waiting for him at home. Norma, an attractive woman, also caught my attention. If I hadn't already had a relationship with Vicky, I might have been tempted to start courting her. But my affection for Vicky was waning, and I couldn't predict what the future held for me. Norma joined me on the couch and told me that the coffee would be ready soon. Then she asked about Jim's affair with my wife, which, as far as I knew, had been going on for at least a month. I hired a private investigator to investigate, but it's possible that this has been going on, I said. Reflecting on the past, I realized that our marriage began to change about two years ago, but my suspicions about Vicky's infidelity have not left me for more than a year. I am convinced that she has been cheating on me since that very turning point in our relationship. Jim may be just one of many, but he's the one I found her with. I haven't told her about this until now. I think she will understand that I am aware of her actions when your husband contacts her tomorrow. I can't wait to see how she reacts to this situation, I said. You knew about this for a whole month, but you let her continue the betrayal? Norma asked incredulously. When I finally accepted the truth, I sought legal help to file for divorce. As it turned out, we live in a state where the law on no-fault divorce applies, that is, it doesn't matter who is to blame. The process is simple. Everything will be divided equally. But I don't want to let Vicky use her deception. Therefore, after reviewing the divorce procedure, 
I began to reorganize and conceal assets, I said. Vicky will only be able to get half of what she expected since the amount has decreased significantly. As for Jim and my wife, they both meet regularly on Mondays and Thursdays. Vicky is rumored to spend these evenings playing cards with her sisters in the sisterhood and attends a book club in the library. Jim, on the other hand, spends these evenings bowling and attending lodge meetings. He even stayed at my house for three nights while I was on a business trip, I said. That's where the videos I have come from. I can't say for sure if this was an isolated incident, but considering that I travel for work about once a month, it's quite possible that this was their usual setup, I said. I think this explains Jim's unexpected business trips. They always came out of nowhere, but I never thought they could be planned, Norma said sadly. What are you going to do? I asked. I'm going to break off relations with him and quickly, until he has the opportunity to hide any assets. I'll do it first thing on Monday morning, Norma replied firmly. I will seek legal assistance from a lawyer. It's a pity that they don't work on Saturdays, otherwise I would have contacted them tomorrow, she said. But I know a lawyer who works on Saturdays. If you are really interested, I can introduce you to him. I'm not joking, I said. I grabbed the phone and quickly dialed a number from speed dial. When the call connected, I turned on the speakerphone and assured them that I didn't need their help with any issues, but a friend needed help. Norma was surprised and asked how I managed to do it. I replied that perhaps the lawyer in question was not very popular. No one thought to call the police, so I was lucky. I'm taking all the luck on myself, my friend. By the way, we're talking on speakerphone and this jerk's wife is sitting next to me. She said she would be at the door of all the working lawyers tomorrow morning. I understand that this is not an ordinary case for you, but could you take it up? I asked the lawyer. Really? With the evidence you have against her husband, it seems like a win-win, he replied. Great, then it's settled. Norma, I said, handing her the phone. After introducing my fraternity brother Sam to Norma, I handed her the phone and then asked where the bathroom was. After leaving, I came back and found that the phone was still on speakerphone. Clearing my throat, I announced my presence, making it clear that I was back. We have settled everything. Take care of yourself. I'm going to bed, Sam said, and abruptly ended the conversation. I put the phone back in my pocket when Norma started talking. Sam said he would submit the documents on Monday morning, and after lunch he would send Jim a summons to work. He assured us that it would be a quick process. He would simply replace my data in the documents with yours. Will your wife also receive the documents on Monday? She asked. Yes, that's what we're planning, I replied. And then what happens? Norma asked. That's when the real battle will begin, I replied. What kind of battle is this? Norma asked. Vicky is not going to give up without a fight. She will hire a lawyer and dispute the divorce. I said with a shrug. She will try to create obstacles at every step, but I will do my best to overcome them. Sam believes that she may insist on consultations in court, trying to delay the process. Although she can't stop the divorce, her goal is to make it expensive enough to make me think twice. Will I change my mind? By no means. If I can still forgive a one-time mistake, then I can't forgive a long-term affair, I said. In addition, I will reveal the derogatory comments she made about me in their private conversations. It should be noted that you do not appear in the best light in these conversations either. It makes me wonder why they decided to maintain a relationship with both of us that seems inadequate to them, I said. I perfectly understand the reason why Jim decided to stay with me. I am the one who financially supports this family. At least for me, the pleasant aspect is that I don't have to endure all this nonsense without feeling guilty, Norma replied. I have a secure prenuptial agreement, Norma said. If the financial assets belong to you, why didn't you think about hiring a private investigator, I asked. My money is locked in a trust fund that I can't touch until I'm 30 years old, and that's still 16 months away. Until then, I can only use them for medical and educational purposes. In addition, I earn a third more than Jim in his current job, and it is my income that supports our lifestyle, she said. 
I don't have the additional funds to hire an investigator, Norma said. Maybe I'm responsible in some way for Jim getting involved with my wife, I said sadly. Which one? Norma asked incredulously. Well, if I had talked to him when I first suspected him of cheating, he might have reconsidered his actions, I replied. The prenuptial agreement clearly spelled out the consequences of adultery, so he knew perfectly well what he could lose if I found out about it. He seems to have a low opinion of me, believing that I will never understand his deceptive behavior, Norma replied with a grin. When can I get copies of your conclusions? Norma asked. Sam has all the information he needs. When you go to process the documents, please inform him that I have asked to provide you with copies, I said. Glancing at my watch, I noted that I would have to leave soon. Can I visit you periodically to find out about the progress of the work? Asked Norma. Of course, I will be very glad to see you, I replied with a smile. Thank you again for the generous gift you gave me. Perhaps I can show my appreciation by inviting you to dinner sometime, Norma said with a smile. That would be great, I replied. I'll contact you as soon as everything calms down at home, I said. I do not know what to expect after my husband returns, Norma said quietly. Perhaps your husband is feeling well enough to contact Vicky. I wasn't going to come into conflict with her until she received the divorce papers on Monday. I should have thought about that before I went after your husband, I said. But it's too late to think about it now, Norma shrugged. When I returned, Vicky looked fine, and I decided that she hadn't heard anything from her lover. She greeted me with a kiss and asked about my delay. I told you that Al, my boss, wanted to celebrate signing Johnson, and we decided to have a few drinks, I said. I tried to call you to let you know, but you didn't pick up your cell phone or your home phone, Vicky said resentfully. I left my cell phone on the desk at work, I replied. Have you eaten yet? She asked anxiously. I ate some minced meat with drinks, so it's okay, I replied. Dessert? Vicky asked playfully. No thanks, I replied. Are you sure? She asked with a wink. What options do we have? I asked. Come into the bedroom, I'll show you, she said. I quickly looked in her direction, noticing her expectant expression. She must have guessed that I was hesitating and spoke up, mentioning that it had been almost a week since our last intimate meeting and she was sad. I took her hint, but hesitated not knowing whether to continue. At that moment, Vicky was far from the top of my list of favorite people. Nevertheless, I decided to take advantage of the opportunity that presented itself to me. I had no idea how long it would take to find another opportunity for intimacy after Vicky left. Grinning, I accepted the challenge. While we were making love in bed, memories of my wife's comments to her lover were spinning in my head. She noted my modest size and lack of satisfaction. For the first time in our marriage, I did what Vicky suggested to my lover, which I had never done before. I turned away and dozed off, thinking about Vicky's feelings. For the first time, I did not hug her after intimacy and did not fall asleep in each other's arms. I hoped she was lying awake and thinking about changing her daily routine. Our usual Saturday morning ritual of waking up, taking a shower, and heading out for breakfast was disrupted by an unexpected change in Vicky's plans. She was obviously worried and wanted to express her affection for me, so we ended up spending the evening together again. After that, we refreshed ourselves in the shower and had dinner together. The rest of the day was spent in the usual weekend chores, mowing the lawn, weeding flower beds, and washing the car. I was grateful that I took the chance to make the most of my time. When we sat down to dinner, Aunt Flo surprised me by showing up a day earlier than expected. Sunday passed quietly. I was doing chores around the house. After lunch, Vicky's mom arrived to take her shopping and I had free time. I took this opportunity to check on Norma and find out how she was doing. She told me about her visit to Sam's office where she took the first steps towards starting the divorce process. Norma also gathered evidence, including incriminating photographs and videos that she viewed at home. I felt determined when Jim came home. He came in as if nothing had happened, 
and I immediately told him to leave. He insisted that the house belonged to both of us, but I didn't back down. I went away for a while and came back with a gun, warning him to leave within 10 seconds. I made it clear that if he stays, there will be consequences. My serious tone made it clear that I was not going to joke, and he quickly left, Norma told me. Have you really thought about taking such a step? I asked in surprise. After I heard how disrespectfully he talked about me in those videos, I would definitely do it. How are you doing? She asked. It's pretty quiet. It seems Vicky hasn't heard anything about your husband. Either that's the case or she's a fantastic actress, which is quite possible. She managed to deceive me for many years, making me think that she was a faithful and caring wife. Well, live and learn forever. Did Sam say when your documents would be ready? I asked. He said he would file the documents with the court early in the morning and could arrange for Jim to receive them at any time convenient for me. I decided that the documents would be handed to Jim at his workplace in the afternoon, Norma replied. I was hoping it would be a surprise for Vicky, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen now, I said with annoyance. I'm sorry that I ruined your surprise, Norma said sadly. You didn't ruin it. I ruined it myself by bumping into your husband on Friday night, I replied. Even if he doesn't say it outright, he'll subtly hint to her when they talk at work on Monday, I said. The good news is that this situation will end soon, apart from legal issues, which will finally allow me to move on. Could we meet on Monday evening? I would like to fulfill my promise to treat you to dinner and celebrate with a few drinks, Norma asked me. I won't be able to confirm this until tomorrow evening, as I'll be busy moving out of the house while Vicky is at work. After all, this is her house, I replied. When her parents retired and moved to Arizona, they gave her this house. I will be flexible with the plans, I said. If you can't come, just call me, Norma said. Despite the fact that the house was officially registered in Vicky's name, it was still the subject of dispute during the divorce proceedings. Despite the generous gift from her parents, the house was mortgaged anyway, and Vicky had to take it over. Despite the fact that the ownership was registered in her name, I contributed my income to cover half of the mortgage payments. I hope to return some of this investment. After returning from the store, Vicky cooked dinner, after which we relaxed on the couch and watched TV until bedtime. When we were in bed, Vicky snuggled up to me, knowing that this was the last time. In the morning, I said goodbye to Vicky with a kiss, and she decided that she would see me after work, hoping that dinner would be ready by my return. She didn't know yet that our plans would change dramatically soon. I decided to take the day off and decided to leave the house before she returned. I went to have breakfast at a nearby restaurant to give her time to leave for work. After finishing my meal, I made sure that Vicky was gone and began to pack my things. My brother Tom showed up 30 minutes after my call, and by 1 o'clock we had taken out all my things and put them in his garage. They'll stay there until I find a new place to live. Tom and his wife Pat kindly offered me the use of their spare bedroom until I found a permanent place to live. I contacted Sam, who confirmed our plan to meet with Vicky and Norma's husband at 2.30 in the afternoon. On a sudden impulse, I decided to call Norma and offer her company while we wait for the expected phone calls after our spouses are served. She was happy to invite me to her place, and I arrived at her place a little after two. Sitting at the kitchen table and enjoying a cup of tea, we discussed our next steps. I had a feeling that Vicky would get in touch, try to deny that she was wrong and offer to talk to resolve the situation. Norma asked if I planned to talk to her. I shook my head. I knew that Vicky would just lie and come up with the usual excuses that scammers use when they get caught. She may be trying to convince me that she loves only me and that we can solve everything, but I saw through this deception. She's been lying to me ever since she got involved with your husband, and maybe even before him. I had no reason to believe her words, so why waste time talking to her? I asked. Basically, that's what I expect from Jim. Is there anything else we can talk about besides these people? She asked suddenly. Sure. What about the Broncos? I started talking about it as a joke, but she surprised me with a serious answer. 
It all comes down to Manning's game. He's had ups and downs in the last couple of seasons, and this year he started intercepting the ball more often. If he can improve his game, the Broncos will have a chance at a championship, she began enthusiastically. I was impressed. She expressed my thoughts perfectly. Amid the discussion of their dominant defense, my phone suddenly interrupted football conversations. When I saw Vicky's name on the caller ID and noted that the time was 2 hours and 35 minutes, I prepared for the upcoming conversation. It's time to face the truth, I muttered, switching the phone to speakerphone mode before answering. Good afternoon, this is Bob. How are things going with all this divorce drama? I asked. When someone finds out about the infidelity of their supposedly faithful spouse, this is a common reaction. How can you accuse me of infidelity? How could you do this to Jim? Vicky was shouting into the phone. In case you haven't noticed, his wife is also aware, as evidenced by the legal documents he received, I replied. I didn't sleep with Jim. Where did you even get this absurd idea from? Vicky continued to say. Oh, from the photos and videos that my investigator received, I replied. I really hope that you won't convince me that this is all just a misunderstanding. These people in the photos and videos cannot be your doppelgangers. I can assume it's a doppelganger or something, but I refuse to believe that Jim has a doppelganger too, and that it was you and his doppelgangers who were caught by my private investigator. Admit it, Vicky. You've been caught, I said. We'll talk about it tonight when we get home, she said firmly. No, we won't talk, I replied just as firmly. When you get home, you'll see that I'm not there anymore. If you want to talk to me, you will need to contact my lawyer. Goodbye, Vicky, I said. As soon as I hung up, Norma's phone rang and she looked at the screen. It was Jim. He never calls during the day, she said. She chuckled to herself wondering what kind of urgent matter had arisen. After answering the call, she turned on the speakerphone. Hello, it's me, Norma replied. What is this divorce news? Jim asked rudely. Norma remarked to me, they seem to be following the same script. What? Her husband asked. I was just telling Bob that it looks like you and your lover are following the same script. Your words when I picked up the phone are almost identical to what Vicky said when she called her husband. Norma replied to Jim. Who is Bob? He intervened. I'm your wife's new partner, I replied. Why are you with my wife? Jim asked. After watching the video collected by his private investigator, we watched how you communicate with his wife and agreed that none of you have the qualities necessary to become adult film stars, Norma told Jim. Really? What's your relationship with this Bob? asked Jim. He gives me more pleasure than you do, Norma replied. You're crazy, Jim shouted into the phone. Norma is much better than my ex-wife, I said, intervening in their conversation. And Bob is even better than you at the peak of your popularity, Norma said, and we smiled at each other. Since Bob has just informed his unfaithful wife about this, all further communication will be conducted through his lawyer, Norma said. Jim was told to find his business card and the legal documents that were handed to him. He was allowed to pick up his belongings at six o'clock in the evening, but Norma warned that during his presence she would be armed and ready. After a short pause, Jim turned to me with a threat in his voice. You caught me off guard, you scoundrel, and I will seek retribution. You won't have to look far, I replied with a grin. I'll be waiting for you on the porch when you come to get your things tonight. Don't forget to take your pride with you, because I have accumulated a lot of anger, and to take it out on you is to get a discharge, said Norma. He was silent, and after thirty seconds, Norma decided that he had finished talking and hung up. Are you really going to wait for him on the steps? she asked. I promised I would, and I don't want him to think I'm a liar or afraid of him. I'll cook dinner in case you want to eat later, she said. I need to see some apartments this afternoon, but I'll be back by five if he comes earlier, I said. There's a lot of space here. You can always move in with me, Norma suggested. I appreciate your offer, but it would be inappropriate, I replied. I'm just offering you a place to stay, nothing more, Norma said. I don't want to give Vicky an excuse to use me against her. I've cornered her, 
and I don't want to give her any opportunities, I said with a smile. The offer stands if you change your mind, Norma said. After unsuccessfully searching for an apartment, I returned to normal around 5 o'clock in the evening. We were sitting on the porch swing, drinking iced tea with cookies and chatting. Eventually, the conversation turned to my upcoming divorce. What are you planning to do with Vicky? Norma asked. I have already taken steps to move out and start the divorce process, I replied. No thoughts of revenge? She asked. None, I replied. It's pointless. The reaction will only make the situation worse, and to be honest, Vicky is not dear enough to me to worry, I said. Shortly before six o'clock, a car pulled up to the house. Norma's husband got out, saw us on the swing, and took a baseball bat out of the trunk. Smiling, he came up to us and jokingly said, I followed your advice and took my pride with me, and, pointing at me with a bat, headed for the porch. While I was scanning the area for any object that could serve as a temporary weapon, the silence was broken by a sudden loud bang that made me turn around and see her husband collapse to the floor. My gaze fell on Norma, who was holding what appeared to be a scaled-down replica of a .45 Colt aimed at her wounded husband. Oh no! He shouted. You shot at me! It looks like I was right. You are completely useless and a threat to society. Norma replied, but at least I only hit you in the leg. Consider yourself lucky that I took aim with this thing, she added. She put the gun next to her on the swing, took her phone out of her pocket and dialed the emergency number. My husband just attacked me with a baseball bat and I had to defend myself. Please send an ambulance, she said urgently. No, he's lying on the ground. He's in pain. He's yelling at me. He's not in a position to hurt me right now. I understand. I'll hang up as soon as the police arrive, unless he manages to get up and attack me again, she said excitedly into the phone. I won't hesitate to use a weapon if he attacks again, she announced before ending the conversation. You'd better leave before the police show up. There's no need to drag you into this, she added. No, I'll support you. Go inside, take all the evidence of your husband's infidelity and bring it here. We'll tell the police that I was delivering things to you and caught him at the scene of the crime, I suggested. At that moment, they heard him shout, You won't dare file for divorce! I will ruin your life if you do this! Norma and I realized that we need to act quickly to protect ourselves. He may try to deny it and accuse us of lying, but it doesn't matter. We have evidence against him, a bat next to him with his fingerprints on it. Otherwise, we'll stick to the truth until he shows up at the entrance. We will tell you how we waited for his joint call with Vicky, tell you in detail what was discussed, and how you informed him that he could pick up his things at six, I told Norma our version for the police. I went to get photos and videos, planning to be back by six so I could be there in case he tried to do something stupid. I arrived a few minutes later, but the police were not there yet. Do you think they'll believe us? Norma asked with concern in her voice. If we stick to our version, I think everything will be fine, I replied. While we were talking, Jim tried to get up, but fell back to the ground, holding his leg and cursing. Norma went to the house to get a copy of the documents, and when she returned, we were sitting on the swing, listening to her husband's complaints and waiting for the police to arrive. We could hear the sirens getting closer. Two police cars pulled up. Four officers got out of them with pistols at the ready and pointed them at us. They spread out and moved towards the porch when Norma and I raised our hands in a sign that we were not a threat. Two officers went to help the wounded man who shouted, She shot at me! It was a woman who shot at me! After the scene was cordoned off, an ambulance arrived to take the injured man to the hospital. I reminded the officers to handle the baseball bat carefully, as it was an important piece of evidence in the case. Norma and I were forcibly detained and taken to the police station, where we were placed in separate rooms. A detective came into my room and listened to my story about what happened. After three long hours, I was finally released and taken back to Norma's house, where I picked up my car and drove to Tom's. Norma stayed with them until noon the next day, when she called me to tell me that she had arrived home safely 
and to inform me about the situation. The police seemed to understand our explanation, as she was charged only with discharging a firearm in the city and released without bail. Reflecting on the time we spent at the station, we consoled ourselves with the fact that everything would probably be fine. I wanted to accept your invitation to dinner, but given the current situation, I think we'd better keep our distance for now, I informed Norma. She agreed, and I promised to keep in touch with her. At four o'clock, Norma called me and informed me that the incident had been reported in the local newspaper. She asked if I had seen her, and I went to the supermarket to get a copy. To my relief, my name was not mentioned, but both Norma and her husband were mentioned in the article. The article said that her husband was hospitalized, but not in critical condition, and Norma was charged but released without bail. Later that day, I received 11 calls from Vicky on my cell phone. I deleted all the missed calls, but eventually answered the 12th one, feeling impatient. What do you need? Don't you understand that all conversations have to be conducted through my lawyer? I snapped. Vicky's pleading voice came from the other end. I need to talk to you, Bobby. I need you to listen to me. I want to explain what happened and why. I want you to know that I love you and I don't want to lose you. I paused before replying. Maybe this is what you need, Vicky. I'm done with you forever. This is our last conversation, I said firmly. I'm going to challenge the divorce, Bobby. I'll hire the best lawyer and delay this as long as possible. I've talked to other people who have been through similar situations and I know what to do, Vicky warned. You still don't understand, Vicky. You can delay the process and make it expensive, but in the end you won't be able to prevent a divorce if I don't agree, I replied. No one will force me to put up or cohabit with you. All your efforts will lead to is spending our funds on lawyer fees and court costs. If you intend to spend years of your life paying for the services of a lawyer, then of course act. But in the end, the divorce will still take place, I said unequivocally. After a short pause, I suggested a different approach. As an option, your reluctance to finalize the divorce may work in my favor. I can instruct my lawyer to completely stop all legal proceedings. To be honest, I don't see the need for this. I have no desire to get married again. Loneliness doesn't bother me at all. In addition, it is financially beneficial. You will not have to worry about expensive legal costs, alimony and division of property. The idea of staying single is becoming more and more attractive to me. So, Vicky, if you want to challenge me, I'll change my mind. I don't mind. And who knows, maybe one day you'll find someone special and I won't give you a divorce, I said with a grin. Having decided to get married, and now going through a divorce, you yourself are faced with expensive legal costs. If I concede now, I can avoid any expenses, but I can decide to fight to prevent you and your new partner from getting married. The ball is at your disposal, Vicky. If you sign the papers, everything will be settled in a few months. If you resist, I will continue my plan. But whatever you choose, one thing is clear. I will disappear from your life forever, I said. Goodbye, Vicky, I said, ending the phone conversation. Over the next month, a lot of good and bad things happened. Vicky did not sign or send back the divorce papers, but she also did not hire a lawyer to challenge the divorce process. Sam believed that she hoped that without signing the documents, the divorce would simply go through, saving her from having to pay for the services of a lawyer. Unfortunately for her, it turned out not to be the case. Although I did not interfere in her decisions, I had evidence of the documents being served, and her lack of reaction suggests that the trial will continue. As for the more vivid events, Norma managed to obtain a restraining order against her husband, who was seriously accused of threats. Unfortunately, less positive developments occurred due to the fact that Jim turned to a lawyer to challenge the divorce, which could lead to a longer and more expensive process. Jim's lawyer's decision to continue to press charges against Norma was made in order not to look soft in the eyes of the public. Vicky's absence from the divorce hearing, probably because she believed that not participating in the hearing would stop the process, eventually led to the judge granting the plaintiff's request. When I left the courtroom, 
I realized that in just 120 days, I would become a free man. That evening I had dinner with Norma, who again offered me her support and accommodation. Now that your divorce is over, you don't have to worry about your appearance anymore, Norma said. If that's the case for me, then it's not for you. You can't afford to give Jim something that could potentially be used against you, I said. I'm not worried because Sam has assured me that the divorce process will be simple, given the circumstances of the adultery and the incident with the bat. But the division of property may become more difficult if I remain involved in it, Norma sadly reported. It doesn't matter. The most he can ask for is half of the house and part of our savings. Besides, I'll get my trust in a year so it doesn't bother me, she replied. But I'm worried. I know this is not the time to admit it. But in recent months I've become interested in you, and I don't want to complicate your life, I said. Why don't you want to talk about it now? Why hold back your feelings? Norma asked. Because I have feelings for you, but I know we can't be together, I replied. Why? she asked in disbelief. Have you ever thought that your feelings might be mutual? Norma asked. However, this is not the main thing. I have to keep a certain distance from you for the sake of your well-being, I replied. Legal issues aside, I have a full prenuptial agreement that spells out what my ex is entitled to, she replied. But this is just the beginning, Norma. We must take care not to give the district attorney or your husband any arguments that they could use against us in court, I said. I may have to testify in both trials, so it's very important to minimize the possible damage, I said. Perhaps we could meet once a week for dinner and present this as informing each other about our divorces, attributing the breakup to our spouses, Norma suggested. But even such a plan is fraught with risk. It is important that we keep our distance until the court cases are resolved, I replied. After a moment of silence, she expressed her disappointment. Why does life have to be so difficult? I can sympathize with her feelings. For the next two months, I invited Norma to dinner every week. It was hard to resist the temptation to go where my heart really wanted to go, but I forced myself to keep my distance. At that time, Vicky also called me every week, begging me to talk to her and asking me to come home. I preferred to just hang up the phone without saying a word. The trial of Norma ended unsuccessfully. The prosecution relied heavily on Norma's husband as a key witness, but his testimony was not justified when he accidentally admitted that the bat was actually intended for someone else, me. It was obvious that the district attorney was unhappy with this oversight as it had a bad effect on his witness preparation. Norma stood by her opinion, and then I had the chance to act as a witness. I confessed to giving false testimony, fully aware of my actions, but I did not regret anything. The man who ruined my marriage deserved to pay back, and I was ready to do whatever it took. It didn't take the jury long to acquit me, and they deliberated for less than 15 minutes. But the trial of Norma's husband was not so successful. It took the jury only 20 minutes to find him guilty, and he was sentenced to a year and one day behind bars. His stupidity was fully manifested when he openly threatened me in front of the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, and the entire audience. I'll get you for this, he spat, further reinforcing his fall. I couldn't help but grin, anticipating the day when he would come crawling for revenge, unaware that his threats were being recorded and would only send him back to prison. As soon as the court proceedings were over, I gladly accepted Norma's offer to move in with her. On the first night of my stay in this house, she quietly entered my room and slipped under the covers next to me. I've been waiting for this moment for months, she whispered, putting her hand on my chest. It was a fantasy come true. During a previous phone conversation with her husband, we jokingly compared Norma's skill in bed with Vicky's, and this turned out to be an accurate assessment. Our night together was just amazing. The next morning, we became passionate again. As a result, it was a whirlwind of passion and desire. I had to insist that we cut back on our classes to conserve energy for our duties. We decided to limit our meetings to one evening during the week and maybe two or three times on weekends. 
Unfortunately, our story did not have a fairy tale ending. Norma and I had an intense bond that often seemed insurmountable to us, but over time we realized that our relationship was built solely on physical attraction and a shared love of football. Despite the fact that we sincerely loved each other, love has never been a factor in our relationship. Despite this, our strong bond and physical togetherness kept us together until she admitted that she was interested in a new relationship with another person. I decided to leave, wishing her well and promising to be there if she ever needed me. I'll remember that, she said. But unfortunately, I never heard from her again. The denouement of the ongoing saga of my life played out before my eyes. Just two days after the divorce from Vicky was officially finalized, she received legal documents in the mail and wasted no time calling me. You really are a scoundrel. How could you betray me like that? She was indignant. I never agreed to all this nonsense. No marital support? You earn twice as much as I do. How can this even be fair? And this is a ridiculous demand of $30,000 for your so-called share in the house. You have no right to claim this house. He belongs to me! She shouted into the phone. I couldn't help but laugh at her anger and replied, Oh, but you agreed. You agreed not to seek legal help and not to fight the divorce. If necessary, you can take out a second mortgage on the house to pay off my share. Look at it as a positive thing. It only cost you 30000 to get rid of me. It's very profitable. But deep down, I didn't want to offend her. Concluding the conversation, I was grateful to her that she did not notice the relief on my face. I didn't want to let her go, but I knew I couldn't stay with a woman who was cheating. I firmly believed in the saying, once you change, you will always change. Besides, I had suspicions that this was not her first betrayal. Two years after my divorce from Vicky, I remarried a beautiful woman who gave birth to twins, and I was happy. As for Vicky, she continued to prefer one-time meetings, but one day she met a man in his apartment and she did not like his rude attitude towards her. Vicky tried to interrupt the date, but the man restrained her by force. After that, Vicky ended up in the hospital with multiple injuries, and the perpetrator ended up in prison. Now Vicky has numerous scars on her face, and she will remember an unsuccessful date for the rest of her life.